Hi, I'm Mike Ricciardi. I'm managing partner and founder of Mercury Capital Advisors. And I'm here today with Mike Facitelli, founder and chief executive officer of the Imperial Companies. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Rico. To start, there seems to be a tremendous amount of foreign capital, a lot of investment coming in from overseas into the U.S. and real estate markets in particular. Could you give us your sense as to what might be behind that trend? I think it's both an absolute and relative uh, objective for those, that capital. They want to get good long-term returns. New York has shown over time it can deliver those. And there are other alternatives to do that around the world, I think, are not quite as uh, attractive. And flight to safety, the U.S. always wins that battle. Low interest rates, you know, and the relative returns, as well as the fact that I think if you look at the U.S., a lot of people are trying to get out, money out of certain sure. countries like China, you know, the Middle East and so forth, and diversify their holdings. And, and New York is probably the best and safest appetite they have to do that. So, Mike, outside of New York, what type of impact have you seen from this influx of global capital as it relates to other gateway cities, if you will? We've seen, obviously, um, a, a lot of increase in prices in the gateway cities, not just New York and San Francisco, obviously Chicago, Boston. Yeah. It, it isn't all over the country, but it's broader than New York. And again, the, the foreign capital is coming from the Middle East. It's coming from Europe. It's coming from China and the Far, and the far East. So uh, each of those territories may have a preferred city. New York's probably number one, but people like D.C., they like Boston, they like, uh, in the, the Far East likes California, sure. San Francisco. So we've definitely seen an impact in pricing across the country for certain types of assets. So Mike, do you have any concerns that um, the market uh, is peaking, if you will, for either commercial or residential, condo, what have you? What's your view on that? But we've seen particular, uh, particularly in the high-end condo market, I think, uh, a pullback and certainly, you know, many people calling it the peak and going down. That market was particularly influenced by the flow of foreign capital, mm -hmm. um, as well as obviously wealth creation in the U.S. With um, hedge funds doing poorly, with the financial services mm -hmm. business suffering a little bit, and with obviously the dollar going higher, mm -hmm. um, and people being a little bit more uh, focused on their homeland, and we've not seen that capital flowing as freely into that particular product type. And obviously when you build a building, you have four or five years ahead sometimes of that demand. So we've got some of those unsold condos that are piling up at the luxury end that I think will be a challenge in terms of pricing for keeping pricing at that level. And how about office? What's your view on office now? We haven't seen the same phenomenon because the end user um, the foreign end user as a tenant has not been a major factor. The foreign, and the foreign capital has been a factor in pricing. So the office fundamental is actually a decent and steady. They're not booming, but they're quite good and, and quite steady. Uh, and even, even uh, you know, showing growth in rents. But prices may have gotten ahead because of, I think, the uh, wall of capital coming in, both foreign and U.S., and low interest rates. And, and cap rates, what uh, impact has that had on cap rates as it relates to the They've been trending rates. down. Um, you know, when, we first, when I first got into Veneta, we were buying things at 8%, 10% cap rates. Mm -hmm. You know, Clearly, cap rates have been trending down, but interest rates have trended down during that whole time. And so as a relative, uh, as cap rates, they look at what's the absolute cap rates, and they're lower. As they spread against the 10-year Treasury, which is around 2%, right. they're pretty consistent with history. So um, they may have not much room to go down the downside, but they're not overly wacky as a bubble low, I think, at the moment. And how about leverage now? How much does leverage play a role in terms of the return profile that you guys are trying to generate and other developers trying to generate? I think it plays an awful uh, it's different for different people. The public REITs don't leverage themselves, you know, they, I think the average is 40%. Mm -hmm. The funds leverage themselves 60, 70%. Some people do even higher leverage than that. And if you think about real estate, one of the, the biggest costs we have is the cost of money, right? If you think of, you know, any building, the cost of money is one of the largest. Sure. So rates going down clearly make uh, more attractive returns at the same level of pricing. That is push pricing up. Um, and I think one of the biggest risks is that rates spike up or go up more more quickly than people think. And, you know, there's a lot of debate, uh, Rico, that, you know, will cash flows win the race against interest rates going mm -hmm. up? And if rates go up without cash flows going up as high, that's going to be a problem. Sure. If rates, um, if rents go up and cash flows go up, to offset those interest rate increases, yeah. we'll have a pretty good equilibrium. Sure. Many industries have begun to be disintermediated, if you will, over the course of the last 15 or so years because of what's called digital Darwinism. 
I'm wondering if uh, the technological movements uh, and secular trends that have taken place, if they've had any impact in terms of the pricing of real estate and how people view real estate as an asset class going forward. I think it depends on the asset class. Clearly, technology is affecting everything. Clearly, um, you know, we, we, in the office market, for instance, people are working with less space per person. Sure. One of the biggest trends, they're outsourcing, outspacing, hoteling in terms of the uh, people using the same space. We've seen it in retail with the internet, sure. you know, and, and certain goods going more on the internet and others less bricks and mortar. We've seen it in hotels with Airbnb coming and disrupting that, um, obviously with no assets, but disrupting that business. So you, you, you clearly see technology impacting, but in the end, we have hard bricks and mortar, yeah. and it's less, I think, of an impact than, than other sectors could be where they can get just wiped out. Any segments of the real estate industry that you are very negative on that you would steer clear of right now? I think real estate, one of the great and things about it and one of the tough things about it is it's really market by market, asset by asset, sure. you know, product type by product, brick by brick, you know. Uh, in certain markets, it may be overbuilding in multifamily because, and one of the greatest problems or uh, red flags to worry about real estate is oversupply. Overbuilding is usually the cause of downturns in real estate. Um, and then if you have a drop off in demand on top of that, you have a double whammy. But it, overbuilding is starting to pick up in certain cities and oversupply is coming in certain areas. So I, I don't, I think it's market by market, segment by segment. It wouldn't be, it's not a like sell short the market, nor is it back up the truck and buy. It's very selective right now.